In the mansion, everyone was busy with tasks. The house owner, Gregory, and the nanny, Melissa, were decorating the room, hanging inflatable balloons, setting the table because there was a celebration, the birthday of his only beloved son, Joe. Today, the little one turned six, but the birthday boy himself wasn't particularly excited. He sat still in his wheelchair, staring blankly ahead, showing no interest in what was happening around him. His father often looked at him with sadness, attempting to cheer him up. Joe, son, look how beautifully we've decorated the room. Grandma and Grandpa will be here soon, along with Uncle Mike and Aunt Brenda, and they'll bring you lots of gifts. What do you want most in the world? I'm ready to fulfill any wish of yours, just to see you smile. The boy suddenly perked up, hope gleaming in his eyes as he softly said, I want to see Mom most of all in the world. I miss her very much. And also, I want to have friends and be able to work by myself. I don't need anything else. Gregory almost cried upon hearing his son's words. He approached the boy, hugged him, and said, Son, darling, you know mom is in heaven. She sees us and loves us. And she gets very upset when she sees you sad. And you will definitely work again soon, I promise you. We will be with you just like before. Playing ball in the yard and I'll try to figure out something so that other kids will play with you." The boy sighed, fell silent, and turned to the window, his eyes once again filled with sadness. Gregory felt deeply troubled and saddened. It had been a year since the terrible accident that had divided their lives into before and after. Joe never fully recovered, and Gregory didn't know what to do with the boy anymore. Sometimes he himself would lose motivation and didn't know what would happen next with his family. Everything used to be so different. Gregory grew up in a wealthy family of businessmen. So from childhood, his parents demanded high achievements from him in everything. The boy studied in a school with a mathematical focus and attended various developmental activities. He always had pocket money, an expensive phone, and fashionable clothes. But his father was strict enough and didn't allow his son to relax or become cheeky. He raised the child to be responsible from an early age. When Gregory started university and began to like girls, it was his mother who started to educate him. She had high standards for the girls he dated, and pleasing her was not easy. Learning about his serious romantic interest, she immediately found out about the potential bride through acquaintances and expressed her opinion about her. However, the girl he fell deeply in love with and intended to marry surprisingly appealed to his parents. She came from a respectable professor's family, was not vulgar, quiet, and well-mannered. His mother agreed with his choice, and he married his university classmate, Marilyn, out of love. The love between them was quiet, sincere, and genuine. When Marilyn became pregnant, the whole family was thrilled, eagerly anticipating the arrival of their son. The pregnancy went smoothly and unnoticed. The girl didn't experience nausea, weakness, and the birth went without complications. Joe grew up as a strong boy, rarely getting sick, and started walking early, constantly bringing joy to his parents. Gregory took over the family business. His parents owned a small confectionery factory. Their cakes were not cheap, but they were made from natural ingredients and according to a special recipe. So they sold out quickly, always having long queues. Marilyn was also actively involved in the business. She often went to meetings with culinary masters, learning from professionals and enjoying creating new masterpieces. Even while on maternity leave, she didn't stop working in the family business and the birth of the child didn't hinder her work, especially since the son was a calm baby, ate well, slept a lot, and didn't cause problems for the young mother. Marilyn often took Joe with her to the production when the child grew up a little. The boy enjoyed being there, eagerly watching how cakes and pastries were made. And, of course, he enjoyed tasting them. On that unfortunate day, Marilyn needed to go to work for just an hour to check on the progress of the work. There was an important order at the factory. 
a huge three-tiered wedding cake, so messing anything up was unacceptable. She drove the car excellently, and Gregory never worried about it. Marilyn put the child in the car seat, beckled him up. She always followed traffic rules, and that's what saved the child's life. Marilyn's car unexpectedly skidded on a turn. The road was slippery from the rain and cold wind, and she crashed into a pole. The airbags didn't deploy for some reason, and the woman hit her head hard on the windshield. The front of the car was completely wrecked. Marilyn died before the ambulance arrived, but the child was unharmed, saved by the child's seat. But he experienced severe stress as he watched his mom die before his eyes. After the tragedy, the boy became withdrawn, stopped talking, screamed at night. But the worst part was, he couldn't stand on his own two feet. Gregory was devastated and overwhelmed by the tragedy that had occurred in his life. His wife's funeral, the longing for her, and the hopelessness, coupled with his son's health issues. He often closed his eyes and thought, why, and for what reason? Did someone destroy my family? I was so happy with Marilyn. Why do good and kind people die while some killers live healthy lives? It's so unfair. Gregory wanted to lie down on his bed, fall asleep, and never wake up again. Because in this real reality, there was no beloved woman anymore. And now she would never be by his side. But his son's problems and condition didn't allow him to do nothing because he needed his father's help and support so much. And despite holding back his emotions, Gregory continued to live and fight for Joe's health. For six months, he took the child to various clinics, consulted with the country's best doctors. He thought the leg problems were caused by a spinal injury. But all the doctors said that physically the child was completely healthy but his psyche had been severely damaged, and all the problems were because of the psychological trauma. No one knew when the child would be able to stand on his feet and whether he would recover at all, and this worried the father a lot. Joe was very upset. Gradually, other children stopped communicating with him. He stopped attending daycare. He constantly stayed at home with the nanny, sometimes going out for a work with her. Gregory didn't give up. And over the year, he managed to achieve some success in the boy's condition. The child started speaking, stopped screaming at night, and stopped fearing his father's car. But the boy still couldn't stand on his own two feet. His father visited many specialists with him, from Chinese healers, osteopaths, to folk healers. But nothing worked. No one could help the boy. They said there were no physical disorders, only psychological trauma. The child's body reacted like this to the accident, and nothing could be done, and no one knew when everything would recover. Little Joe, when he remembered his mother, always took the plush teddy bear she gave him in his hands and talked to it as if it were her. The boy hugged it and cried, choking on tears. He desperately missed her love and affection. He often remembered how she put him to sleep, kissed him, whispered that he was the most beloved son in the world. Or he remembered how they would lie together until lunchtime on weekends, watching cartoons and eating vanilla ice cream with raspberry jam. So today, even though it was the boy's birthday, there was no festive mood. The son was constantly sad. Of course, he loved his dad very much and always wanted to spend time with him. But after that tragedy, the child became completely different not like before. Gregory went to the market. He needed to buy more drinks and some additional items for the festive table. Then he planned to pick up his parents and bring them home to his grandson. It was pouring rain outside, and the wind was so strong that it was hard to stay on one's feet because of the gusts of wind and rain. As he was leaving the store, Gregory noticed a woman with a child on the porch. The woman was no more than 30 years old. She was poorly dressed, but she looked neat, wearing a thin short jacket and a scarf on her head. Her daughter was also lightly dressed, not suitable for such cold weather. She wore an old jacket, a thin hat, and short boots, shivering from the cold and clinging to her mother. Gregory felt sorry for them. He couldn't help it, so he took out a large bill from his wallet, approached them, 
and said, Excuse me, you and your child must be freezing. Here, take the money and buy yourself something to eat. And go inside. You need to warm up. Why did you decide to go out in such a storm? How will you get back? Buses hardly run now because of this awful weather. Half of the routes have already been cancelled. Utility companies can't cope with cleaning up the aftermath of such a hurricane. The woman looked at him gratefully as her daughter was shivering from the cold. Thank you for the money. It's very kind of you. Don't worry. I'm not homeless. My name is Cynthia and my daughter's name is Kelly. We live outside the city. We just didn't manage to leave in time. We missed the bus. So we were warming up in the store until the security guard asked us to leave. I can see the bus stop from here. As soon as the bus comes, my daughter and I will leave. The woman said, Gregory was about to say goodbye when suddenly he thought, what if I invite them to my son's birthday party? Joe will play with the girl. He has been longing for interaction with other children. Let the mom and daughter warm up, eat some delicacies. It's obvious they don't have enough money for food. After scrutinizing the woman once more, Gregory decisively said to her, Cynthia, I invite you and your daughter to my son's birthday party. He turns six today. His name is Joe. I understand that this offer is unexpected. After all, we don't know each other at all. Let this be my request to you. My son doesn't have many children visiting him. It upsets him a lot. And your daughter can play with him. And you can warm up, eat delicious food, and relax. Then I'll call a taxi for you to go home. So, I'll call a taxi for you to come to my place now. When you arrive at the address, enter the door access code. 357. There, a nanny will meet you. I'll call her and let her know you'll be arriving soon. I just need to go pick up my parents. Please, don't hesitate. Joe is a wonderful, kind boy. Everything will be fine. Cynthia was delighted and gladly agreed. Thank you for the invitation, Gregory. I can't feel my legs anymore because of the cold. And I really hope my daughter's feet won't freeze. And the bus still hasn't arrived. You're just saving us. Don't worry. We won't stay long. We'll come to congratulate your son, warm up a bit, and leave. We're going to uncle's house. Really? Can I play with the boy? What should we give him as a present? The girl asked excitedly. Yes, indeed. It's a bit awkward to go to a birthday party without a gift. I'll quickly buy a little car or a coloring book with pencils, Cynthia said. The man tried to dissuade her, explaining that Joe had plenty of toy cars. But the woman was adamant and said she wouldn't go visit the child without a gift. In the end, Cynthia chose an inexpensive glowing ball in the store with snowflakes that fell beautifully down when flipped, swirling to pleasant music. The girl was satisfied with the purchase and agreed to go to the party. Gregory sent Cynthia and her daughter home by taxi, still not understanding how he had dared to invite strangers to his house in the first place. Meanwhile, he went to pick up his parents. As usual, his mother took a long time to get ready changing her coat twice, fixing her hair, and finally, they set off. By the time they got home through the heavy downpour, over an hour had passed. Gregory decided not to mention Cynthia to his parents. He knew in advance that his mother wouldn't approve of the idea of inviting strangers home. She always had her reservations about new people and preferred to socialize with trusted acquaintances. When Gregory and his parents entered the house, there was already a festive atmosphere. He had hired an entertainer in advance, and the lively clown was already entertaining the guests. Everyone enjoyed the entertainer's program. The adults happily sang songs with him and solved riddles. After all, there was a prize for each correct answer. But the birthday boy was not interested in the clown. The boy was engrossed in playing with Kelly, the girl invited from the street. They played on the floor in the room, on a huge soft snow white carpet, engrossed in their own game, oblivious to everything around them. Cynthia modestly sat at the edge of the festive table, clapping her hands and observing with interest as the guests participated in the contests. 
Against the backdrop of the richly dressed family friends, she certainly stood out. She wore an old faded sweater and jeans of an indeterminate color. Her hair was simply tied in a ponytail. Surprisingly, even in such simple clothes and without makeup, she looked decent. Apparently, she had always been a lovely blonde with big blue eyes and fair skin. Her daughter, on the other hand, was her complete opposite, with dark hair, tan skin, and brown eyes. Kelly was restless, cheerful, and very sociable. She kept telling Joe stories, and he gladly engaged in conversation with her. The father couldn't contain his joy. He hadn't seen his son so happy in a long time. Gregory's parents congratulated their grandson, gave him a huge remote-controlled car, and a modern children's encyclopedia with beautiful illustrations. The boy thanked them, kissed his grandmother, and they immediately began inspecting the gifts with Kelly. Gregory decided to introduce Cynthia to his parents. Mom, Dad, meet Cynthia. We met her and her daughter by chance near the market today, and I decided to invite them to the celebration. Just look at how happy Joe is. He has been dreaming of playing with other children for so long. In my opinion, interacting with a child is the best gift for him. He hardly even pays attention to the clown. Upon hearing how Cynthia ended up here from her son, Ashley was not at all pleased and began to scold him in front of the guest. Gregory, is it really acceptable? This is extremely thoughtless of you to invite poorly acquainted people of such strange appearance to visit. What if they're swindlers? We don't know how interacting with such a poor girl will affect our grandson yet. You're such a trusting son of mine. Cynthia felt hurt and awkward. She blushed and seemed to be ready to leave. After all, the other guests were also looking at her strangely, and no one was particularly socializing with her. But Gregory immediately responded harshly to his mother. Mom, I am not a child anymore, and I have my own life. We all came to celebrate your beloved grandson's birthday, so why spoil it for him? I repeat, once again, Cynthia and Kelly are my guests, and I ask you to treat them with respect. Agreed. Instead, try our new signature pie with meat and cheese. The chef did his best for me, and I even ordered your favorite cake. Enjoy. The woman pursed her lips and stopped being disdainful towards Cynthia. Her upbringing didn't allow her to create a scene at the birthday party, and she didn't want to upset her grandson. However, all evening she looked displeased at the uninvited guest, and if the girl smiled at her son, the woman even felt a little angry. The wise mother decided that later, she would have a serious talk with Gregory and find out where he met this homeless girl. She understood that her son suffered from loneliness, but that wasn't a reason to bring homeless people from the street into their home. It quickly got dark outside, and the guests started dispersing to their homes. The parents also left by taxi. Only Cynthia and Kelly remained. It's late. My daughter and I need to go home too. Thank you for everything, Gregory. It was my first time at such a magnificent party. We enjoyed it very much. The clown was so amusing and did a great job at the program. It's evident he's a real professional who kept everyone entertained all evening. And your son is wonderful, a very smart boy. It seems like he and Kelly have become great friends, the girl said timidly. Joe suddenly started pleading with his father. Dad, please, can Kelly stay overnight with her mom? We are best friends now. I have so much fun spending time with her. Please. After all, today's my birthday. So, can I make any wish? Gregory looked at Cynthia and suggested. Indeed. Why should you go anywhere tonight? The rain hasn't stopped. Stay with us in the house. There are two beds in the children's room. Kelly will sleep there with Joe. And I'll make up a bed for you in another room. You won't bother us at all. Cynthia smiled and replied. All right. We won't spoil the birthday boy's day. We'll stay. But on one condition, I'll clean up everything myself. Wash the dishes. Put everything back in its place. And tidy up the room. I should do something useful for you. After all, I feel awkward. 
You've taken us in, fed us, and even offered us to stay overnight. Gregory was delighted, bustling around, making up beds for the guests, and preparing clean towels and robes in the bathroom. Meanwhile, he observed how confidently the guest dealt with the dirty dishes, scrubbing them until they gleamed, tidying up the drawers. It was evident that she was industrious, not lazy. The children played a little more in the children's room, and then Cynthia bathed them in the bathroom and put them to bed. The children fell asleep instantly. They didn't even need a bedtime story. The adults also quickly went to sleep. Gregory was so tired after the whole day that he didn't even notice when he fell asleep. He had a day off tomorrow, and he told the nanny not to come to work that day. After all, he could sleep at home at least once a week. Gregory woke up closer to lunchtime, hearing the radio call from the children's room. This meant that Joe was also awake and needed help. The man immediately remembered yesterday's guests, got out of bed, and realized that there was no one else in the house. Cynthia and Kelly had left. He noticed a note on the kitchen table that read, Thank you for the party. Kelly and I enjoyed everything. The homeowner felt a bit sad again, and his son became melancholic, but there was nothing to be done. People have their own lives. The week passed unnoticed. Gregory worked a lot, constantly busy with something. But every evening, he watched Joe texting someone on his phone. The boy was very engrossed in communication, often smiling as he received emojis and photos. Son, have you made new friends? Who are you texting? His dad asked in surprise. But the child immediately hid the phone in his pocket and cryptically replied, Yes, dad, I have new friends now, but it's a secret. And the boy now often flipped the light up bowl Cynthia gave him, turned on the music, and watched thoughtfully as the snowflakes fell beautifully. One evening, while having dinner with his son, Gregory saw a segment on the news about a crime. A tragedy occurred in one of the city's neighborhoods. A family of well-known businessmen died at the same time, during the night after a celebration. The presumed cause of death was alcohol poisoning. Their three-year-old daughter, Kelly, disappeared without a trace. The investigation is examining all the circumstances of this mysterious and complicated case and the police are searching for the child. The man was flustered and even dropped the remote. On the video was the same girl Kelly, who had recently been at their house. Dad, the girl on TV looks a lot like Kelly. Is that her? Are they showing Kelly on TV? Joe exclaimed. Gregory was surprised and frightened. I don't know, son. I hope it's not her. Are you talking to Aunt Cynthia on the phone by any chance? Tell dad the truth. I really need to find her to find out everything. Maybe Cynthia and Kelly need help. They left us so suddenly. We didn't even get to say goodbye to them, and I didn't get their address or phone number. The boy showed his father the messages on his phone, and from the photos, the man understood that they were hiding in some small town. In one of the photos Joe sent, little Kelly was standing by a sandbox, and the address of the house was visible in the corner. Gregory quickly found online which nearby small town had such a street and house and decided to go there, talk, and find out from the woman why she had abducted someone else's child. Gregory left his son at home with the nanny and set off to find Cynthia and Kelly in the small town. The roads were washed out from the rain, making driving very difficult. The man quickly found the right house on the outskirts of the town. However, he couldn't drive up to it because of the mud on the road, even with an SUV. So he had to leave the car at the beginning of the street and walk. The house didn't look very well maintained, with old wooden windows and a crooked old fence. But overall, it seemed sturdy and spacious. It was clear that a hard-working owner once lived there. The path to the house was cleared of mud, and the lights were on in the windows, indicating that the owners were home. The man knocked on the fence. A dog barked loudly in the yard, and a shadow of a person appeared at the window, but nobody opened the door for a long time. Gregory knocked harder with his fist. He wasn't going to give up and leave without finding out anything. He thought that if they weren't opening the door, 
There must be something to fear and hide. Finally, a frightened Cynthia appeared at the door, looking around as if afraid to see someone, and quickly let Gregory in. It was warm in the house. Kelly was playing with a doll on the bed, and when she saw the guest, the girl smiled and waved her hand. Recognizing the man, Cynthia began questioning Gregory. How did you find us? Did Joe tell you? I probably shouldn't have been messaging him. I wanted to support the boy so he wouldn't feel lonely. And now you've found me. The man decided to get the truth from the girl right away and asked confidently, Cynthia, why did you kidnap someone else's child? I know everything. All the channels are talking about the death of the businessmen. Kelly was shown in the report, and everyone is looking for her. Tell me the truth, please. Maybe I can help you. Anyway, you won't be able to hide here for long. Someone from the neighbors will recognize the girl and call the police. The woman burst into tears, and her hands trembled. Let's talk about this not here. Come with me to the kitchen so Kelly doesn't hear anything. The girl said, leading the way to the kitchen and sitting down at the table. Kelly is not a stranger to me. She is my daughter. I gave birth to her three years ago. You are lying. Kelly looks nothing like you. She has a completely different appearance. If you don't tell the truth, I'll call the police myself. Why do you need this girl? What did you plan to do with her? Confess. Gregory said harshly. Cynthia grabbed the man's hands and almost started shouting. Don't call the police. Please, they'll take her to an orphanage. I'll tell you everything. I'll start from my childhood so you can understand. This is my home. I was born and raised here. My mom worked on the farm all her life. And my dad was a real hero. He even served in hot spots and had many combat awards. Our dog, Cooper, who lives in the yard, is his loyal frontline friend. Dad saved him when he was just a little puppy. They wanted to put him to sleep because he wasn't a purebred German Shepherd. But Dad felt sorry for the dog and didn't allow it. Took him in and started training him, teaching him commands. Sometimes he took him to dog handlers. And you know, Cooper turned out to be such an excellent smart search dog, even better than purebred German Shepherds. Our dog found people under rubble and saved them. My dad died many years ago, but Cooper still serves our family. He's very smart and kind, knows all the commands, but he's really old now, practically blind. When dad died, I was just finishing school. It was a tragedy for us. Without him, the house immediately felt empty, and financially, it became very difficult. My mom's salary wasn't enough for us to live on. After finishing school, I left for the city to find work. It's hard to find a decent job in our small town. But my mom was against it. She thought only dishonest people lived in big cities. She even dreamed of marrying me off to a local farmer's son. But he was so stupid and ugly. So I got offended and left. And mom couldn't understand me and got upset. In the city, I got a job as a maid in the family of those businessmen. Recommended by an acquaintance. A woman from our small town brought me to the staffing agency because she herself worked as a cook in some wealthy family in the city. So she helped me find a job. As my mom asked her to. The family I started working for turned out to be quite good. The husband and wife didn't argue and paid me a good salary. I, too, didn't slack off. I tried to do my duties well. In general, I was satisfied with this job. Several years passed. A couple of times a month, I would come to my mom's house, help her, and miss her. Then another tragedy struck our family, one we didn't expect. My mom fell seriously ill. I had noticed for a while that she was losing weight sleeping a lot, and had sold her farm because she couldn't manage it anymore. But we thought it was just fatigue, and I kept bringing her vitamins, but they didn't help. Later, I couldn't bait any more and took her to the city to see a doctor, and that's when everything became clear. We needed to gather a huge amount of money for treatment and surgery. Mom was upset. 
she understood that we would never be able to gather such a large sum. And I promised her that I would find the money for the operation and save her life. I constantly thought about it, not understanding how to save the most dear and closest person to me. I was very upset, cried often, and of course, the hosts noticed my condition. Kathy, the host's wife, found out what happened to me, and I asked them to lend me money because no bank would approve a loan for me. The couple thought about it, and then offered me to become a surrogate mother for the family since they couldn't conceive a child for many years due to the wife's health problems. Of course, I initially refused. I couldn't understand how one could give away their child. And overall, it seemed strange. Perhaps if I already had my own children, agreeing to such an offer would have been easier. But now I had to give birth and give away my only baby. But my mom's condition was getting worse, and I agreed to become a surrogate mother. I just didn't have any other way to save my mom's life. I was very lucky. I was able to get pregnant on the first try, and the host's wife started wearing a fake belly to control the pregnancy. She went to the hospital for checkups, where they bribed all the staff, and I didn't appear anywhere during the pregnancy so that no one would suspect anything. The birth also took place at home because the businessman was able to arrange everything. As soon as I gave birth to the girl, they took her away from me immediately and didn't even allow me to feed the baby, and I was so upset. You can't imagine what it means to carry a child inside you, feel it, give birth, and then just give it away. How difficult and painful it is. They paid me, as agreed, without deception. And of course, they decided to dismiss me, taking a written promise from me that I would never, under any circumstances, look for the child or interfere in their family's affairs. The birth documents were issued for their family, as if Kathy had given birth to her that night. So officially, I'm a stranger to Kelly. I written to my mom as a different person. I cried constantly, feeling like something important had been taken away from me. But I tried to be cheerful. I didn't have time to do nothing. I needed to save my mom's life. There was enough money for all the treatment. They admitted my mom to the hospital, and we fought for her health for a whole year. The doctors performed surgery, and there seemed to be improvement in her condition, but her body couldn't handle another round of chemotherapy, and she died in my arms in the hospital room. I confessed to my mom just before her death where I managed to find such a large sum of money because I couldn't keep quiet about it anymore. After learning my story, my mom cried for a long time. You shouldn't have done that, daughter. A child should be with its mother, and a mother is the woman who gave birth to them. Poor you, my daughter, you ruined your life because of me. And the most important thing is that it was all in vain. I constantly thought about my mom's last words. I felt the pain of losing my mom, loneliness, longing, and a huge desire to see my little daughter. Every morning, I got up and went to work in the farm's cafeteria as a cleaner. And in the evening, I came home and cried. And it was like this almost all the time. I suffered greatly, couldn't sleep at night, dreaming about my childbirth and my daughter. I kept wondering, how was she feeling? How had she changed? What was life like for her and that family? And then, a week ago, I couldn't take it anymore and decided to go to the home of those businessmen. I planned to kneel before them and beg to see my daughter, even if just for a minute. I waited for a long time at the door of the apartment, but no one answered. And then I realized the door wasn't locked. I quietly entered the apartment, sensing danger. And then I saw that the husband and wife were lying dead in bed, their skin already blue, while the daughter was sitting in the closet crying. Apparently, the girl was very frightened. I didn't expect to see this, so I grabbed Kelly and ran out of the apartment. I didn't even have time to dress her properly. There wasn't enough time. I wrapped her in a warm blanket that was lying on the armchair and rushed to the station, where we got into a taxi and went to my place. At home, I found my old childhood things and changed the child. We started living here together. Surprisingly, Kelly, either from shock or stress, 
immediately came to me and didn't cry at all. She doesn't know or understand that her parents are no longer there, and she constantly asks me when they will come back. She calls me Aunt Cynthia because I had to lie and say I'm her mom's friend. I know I did something terrible. I should have called the police and not taken Kelly from the apartment. But it happened just like that. I'm sure I would have been accused of murder, and the girl would have been sent to an orphanage. Is that any better? I don't know what to do next. I'm completely confused. But I understand one thing. I won't give Kelly to anyone. Even if it means dying. I carried her under my heart for nine months. She's my daughter, not that businessman's. After all, his wife couldn't even conceive eggs for fertilization. Hearing Cynthia's story, Gregory grabbed his head. Cynthia, what now? You can be understood, of course, but you've ended up in a very difficult situation. I don't think the police will bother to figure out who killed her parents since you are the last one who saw the deceased spouses. Your fingerprints must have already been found in the apartment, and according to Kelly's documents, she's their daughter. It means you kidnapped the girl. And how to prove otherwise is a very big question. And you have a motive for the murder too. Oh well, it's a complicated situation. You need to think carefully. But before the man could finish, someone smashed the window with a stone, and two bandits burst into the house. Cynthia didn't understand at first and started shouting loudly. Did you bring the police to me? Yes. I won't give up, Kelly. Darling, come to me. I'll have you. The girl got scared and climbed onto Cynthia's lap, hugging her tightly. There she is, the little heiress. Quickly bring her to us. We need her alive. And the woman can be punished to learn not to mess with us, shouted one of the bandits. They started trying to take the girl from Cynthia, but Gregory began to defend them. And who's this? Where did you come from? Better not interfere. Otherwise, you'll have problems. But the man couldn't leave the woman and the child in such a critical situation and started fighting with the bandits. He remembered his karate and wrestling lessons from childhood. A fight broke out. The man protected Cynthia and Kelly because he was a brave man. The girl quickly ran out with the child into the yard and untied her dog, shouting, Cooper, save your mistress. The dog quickly darted into the house like a madman, attacking the intruders furiously and tearing their things apart. One of the bandits pulled out a knife and started waving it around. He wounded Gregory and shouted, Shut up! Don't interfere! How did you even get here, Defender? Jack, get rid of this crazy dog! It bit my leg! We need to kill it! Neighbors started making noise, calling the police, and three strong men also began to fight because in a small town, neighbors rushed to help. Soon, the police arrived at the house. All participants in the fight were taken to the police station, including Cynthia. Gregory was taken to the hospital, and Kelly was taken to a children's shelter pending clarification of all the circumstances. The girl cried. She didn't want to be taken away from Cynthia. She hugged her by the neck and cried out, Aunt Cynthia, don't give me away. I'm scared. The woman also cried heavily, thinking she was saying goodbye to her daughter forever. Now she'll be put in jail and accused of murdering the businessmen and stealing the child. Kelly, know that mommy loves you very much and will never forget you. You're the most beloved and dear girl. The girl whispered, Gregory, in critical condition, was taken to the hospital. But while he was conscious, he managed to call the nanny and say, Melissa, I'm in trouble. I'm injured. They're taking me to the hospital. Please stay with Joe all the time. I have no one else to rely on. The woman screamed and began to run around the house, gathering the owner's things and the documents he needed in the hospital. The nanny tried to hold back her tears but Joe realized that something bad had happened because his father hadn't been home for a long time. Nanny, what happened? Did dad call? Why has he been gone for so long? I'm scared. Where are you going? Don't leave me alone. The woman hugged the boy tightly, kissed him, and started explaining. Joe, don't worry. 
Daddy got sick, and they put him in the hospital. We'll call a taxi now and go to the hospital to see him. Let's concentrate so we don't forget anything. If you want, I can take you to Grandma's. You can stay with them for now. Why do you need to go to the hospital with me? The boy stubbornly shook his head. No. First I'll go to Dad. I want to see him. Nanny, Dad won't die like Mom. Right. I'm so scared. Melissa tried to reassure the child again, although she herself was very worried. Joe, why would you say that? Of course, he won't die. The doctors will cure him and send him home. We can't be upset right now. We need to support your dad. The boy was so worried about his father's condition that he nervously twisted the button on his jacket the whole way, almost tearing it off. Little Joe was most afraid of losing his father, as after his mother's death, he was the closest and dearest person to him. Melissa and the boy waited for a long time in the hospital corridor. And finally, the doctor came out of the ward and said, Don't worry, everything is fine. We stitched up the wound. There's no life-threatening danger. Boy, don't worry. Your dad will recover soon. No need to cry. Can I see him? Please. I want to see dad. The boy asked quietly, and the little one started crying again. He couldn't cope with his emotions. Well, as an exception, come into the ward for a short while. The doctor agreed. Melissa wheeled the child into the room. Gregory was lying on the bed, pale and bewildered, his arm and shoulder bandaged. Joe, seeing this, suddenly jumped off the wheelchair and, staggering on his own legs, went to his father, hugged him tightly, and cried heavily again. Dad, I was so scared. Don't go away for so long anymore. Don't leave me. I'm scared. Son, did you finally get up from that wheelchair? I can't believe it. Joe, work a little more. Please, Dad. I'm sure that with this joy, I'll feel better. We finally did it. The father said, smiling. Joe only now realized that he could walk again, just like before. The boy hesitantly got off the bed and walked around the ward, at first slowly, cautiously, with small steps, and then faster. Dad, I can work by myself, just like before. I can run with the other kids and play ball. The son shouted happily. Melissa was also happy. She knew how much the owner worried about his son's illness, how much strength and patience he had put into making the boy his old self again. Oh, thank God, you heard us. Joe can walk again. What a joy for us. Over time, Gregory felt better, and his son visited him in the hospital every day with the nanny. But he had a difficult conversation with his parents. Learning from the nanny about the incident, they immediately came to the hospital. The mother began to kiss her son and speak, wiping her tears. Oh, Gregory, how could this happen? We don't seem to have enemies in the company, and it's not such a time now. Did the competitors really stoop to this? And they stabbed you with a knife. I hope you reported it to the police. It wasn't because of my work. I'll tell you everything now, but I'm sure you won't like it. Gregory replied calmly. When Ashley learned who and why her son suffered from, she became outraged. I told you. I warned you that these street acquaintances never end well. Why do you need other people's problems? Tell me. If they took this Cynthia to the police station, then she's guilty of something. Maybe she killed those businessmen. There's no need to defend her. You've already suffered enough. But Gregory couldn't take it. Mom. How can you say such things? You yourself taught me from childhood that we should help people if trouble happens. I believe Cynthia, and I'll help her. Got it. Whether you like it or not. You don't even know her, and yet you're making conclusions and accusing the girl of murder. And if you couldn't see me for many years, wouldn't you do everything to find out how I live? What's with me? As a woman, you should understand her. Yes, Cynthia made a mistake, but it's only because she missed her own daughter. I can't imagine what would have happened to me if Joe hadn't been there. 
Children are the meaning of our lives, and for them, we are capable of anything. The father intervened in the conversation and supported his son. I agree with you, son, and I'm proud of you. You didn't fear the thugs and defended the woman with the child. This act is worthy of respect. I can tell from your stories that you liked this Cynthia, didn't you? You wouldn't defend her if she meant nothing to you. Listen to yourself and do as you know. The main thing is to recover soon. We were very worried about you. Gregory thanked his father for his support. It was very important to him now and reassured his mother that the worst was over and the police would sort everything out and punish the guilty. And he wasn't in danger anymore. Ashley hugged her son goodbye and began to hate this poor girl even more who inexplicably appeared in her son's life because Gregory got into trouble because of his association with her. The only thing that pleased her was that their grandson stood on his feet. The man decided to help Cynthia solve these problems she got into because of her own foolishness. But it was impossible to do it alone. So he decided to hire a good lawyer to defend her interests in court. After all, everything was against her. Child abduction, concealing a crime, and maybe even complicity in it. The two thugs who attacked them started refusing to cooperate with the investigation. It was only known that one of them was Roger, the late businessman's cousin, and the other accomplice, previously convicted man Bruce. Gregory spared no money and hired the best lawyer in town, Wayne. He had hundreds of successfully completed difficult cases in his legal practice. It was he who managed to gather all the information to prove Cynthia and Kelly's relationship. They conducted a DNA test, and it showed that they were indeed mother and daughter, and that was already half of the success. Wayne meticulously questioned all the participants of that ill-fated banquet, after which the businessmen died, and reconstructed the events of that evening minute by minute. Many remembered that it was Roger who brought that very cognac, which the deceased spouses drank. Other guests preferred wine or champagne. The lawyer demanded a search of Roger's house, where they examined all the belongings and documents, and finally found evidence. One drug was hidden in the cabinet, which in large doses causes respiratory paralysis. Wayne realized that this could help in the investigation and insisted on the exhumation of the spouses. He brought in his own experts, and they found traces of the substance in the businessmen's bodies. It turned out that the cousin had decided to kill the whole family and thus take the inheritance and become wealthy. The only obstacle was the girl, as he didn't dare to get rid of her immediately. He thought that after his brother's death, he would take custody of her and then be able to kill her. But everything didn't go according to plan and the girl disappeared from the apartment. When the police gathered all the evidence that Roger was guilty, he realized that he couldn't escape punishment and decided to confess everything honestly. Our fathers, Gerald's and mine, were indeed brothers, but they were completely different people. One became a wealthy businessman, and my father remained a poor man. That's the injustice of it all. From childhood, I hated Gerald, envied him so much. Gerald studied at a prestigious university, and then his father handed over his business to him, and he was lucky. He married a beautiful girl. They even managed to have a daughter when they were already adults. And I kept asking him to hire me in his company, but he refused, saying that there would be problems if relatives worked together. He tried to teach me how to live properly, but I didn't need his advice. I didn't want to work as a manager all my life. It was just unfair. And then I lost a lot of money in cards. And I started to be threatened that if I didn't pay off the debt, they could kill me. That's when I came up with a plan to solve all my problems. And everything would have worked out for me if it weren't for this girl who stole the girl and her protector who started fighting with me. Where did they even come from? The investigator was shocked by Roger's cruelty. He couldn't understand how one could kill their brother and his wife and talk about it so calmly. How did you find Cynthia? How did you learn her address? The investigator asked, is it a secret? My friend was godding that apartment and waiting for the moment to call the police. So he remembered that crazy woman well and tracked her 
And then we decided to take the girl back. Frankly, I don't understand why she needed that woman. So we broke into her house, but we didn't know she wouldn't be alone. The man probably deliberately parked his car far from the house, so our plan didn't work out. They ruined everything for me. The investigator couldn't understand this murderer, and he asked, Don't you feel sorry for your brother and his wife, whom you killed? You were also planning to kill a child. Is it all for money? You don't understand anything. If it weren't for this girl, I would be rich in a year, and I don't care how I would have achieved it. Roger angrily replied. The investigator shook his head and said, there's no point talking to you about conscience. Well, in prison, you'll understand a lot. You'll repent every day. Cynthia was finally released home, and Gregory met her at the prison gates. She looked lost and exhausted. Seeing her savior, she was relieved and ran to him. Thank you for coming. I feel terrible. I saw many bad people in prison. You can't imagine how scary it is there. I was so upset. At first, the investigator tried to make me confess to the murder, but I decided that even if I couldn't get out of prison, I wouldn't admit to someone else's guilt. And I miss my daughter so much. How is she in the shelter? She must be going through a lot. First, her parents died. Then the girl barely got used to me, and now they took her to the shelter. Why does this poor girl have to face such problems? How can I explain to her that I'm her real mom? What if someone else adopts her? Then I'll never be able to find her. Cynthia cried, and Gregory tried to comfort her, stroking her thin shoulders. Don't cry. I'm sure everything will be fine. You've been released from prison, and they don't suspect anything. And you have a DNA test that says Kelly is your biological daughter. Now all that's left is to legalize your rights as a mother and prove that Kelly is the sole and rightful heir of the businessman. You know what? Let's go to my house. I think Joe will be happy to see you. You'll rest a bit, and then we'll go visit Kelly at the shelter. You shouldn't be alone in your house with broken windows. And also, let's address each other more casually after everything we've been through together. Gregory said, Gregory, I forgot to say the most important thing. Thank you so much for saving me and my daughter back then. If it weren't for you, they would have taken Kelly for sure, and they might have killed me. Look at the trouble I've caused you, Cynthia exclaimed. Nothing in life happens just like that. If it weren't for your problems, my injury, my son would never have gotten up from his wheelchair. He can work on his own now. We finally got rid of that hateful wheelchair. My son worried so much about me that he got up from his wheelchair himself. Can you imagine? It's such a joy for me. And anyway, I really like you, Cynthia. As a person and as a woman. After my wife's death, I never looked at women. I thought I'd never stop loving my Marilyn. But now I look at you and realize that I'm falling in love. Gregory smiled. After their conversation, they went to Gregory's mansion where Cooper, happily wagging his tail, ran to his owner, licking her and barking loudly. Cynthia cried, kissed the dog's wet nose, and wiped her tears. Cooper, how are you here? I'm so glad to see you. Thank you, Gregory, for taking care of my dog. I didn't even hope to see him alive, and I was afraid to ask about it. After all, he served our family for so many years. Several times he saved my father in the war, and now he protected me and my daughter. She exclaimed, how could I let such a noble faithful dog die? He, like me, was injured by the bandits, but the doctors saved Cooper, treated his wound, and I had him brought home to me. Don't worry, he's doing well here. He has a spacious enclosure, it's warm, and they feed him like in a hotel. We've become very good friends. Joe spends a lot of time with him, Gregory assured her. The son was very happy with the guest. Now he ran and jumped around a lot and talked a lot. And he also asked about Kelly. Where is she now? And when will she come? Cynthia cried again and replied, she'll come soon. I'll definitely take Kelly from the shelter 
and I won't give her to anyone else. Cynthia enjoyed a hot shower, had dinner, played with Joe, and outside it was already getting dark. Time to go to bed. But at night, she had the same nightmare that had haunted her for three years. She dreamt of giving birth to a girl, screaming in pain, and then feeling relief when hearing the baby's first cry. She hoped to see her daughter, but the baby was taken away immediately. Cynthia cried out, No, no, that's my daughter. Gregory heard the scream from Cynthia's room, got scared, and thought something had happened and she needed help. He quietly entered the guest room and saw Cynthia tossing on the bed, her hair sticking to her forehead, shouting her daughter's name and crying. He tried to wake her gently, whispering, Cynthia, wake up, you are having a nightmare. It's just a bad dream. Finally, she opened her eyes, looking around in surprise. She felt embarrassed for scaring her host, especially since he saw her in just a thin nightgown. Gregory looked closely at Cynthia, dressed in the very nightgown with embroidered flowers that he had given Marilyn. She had never worn it before. Suddenly, he hugged Cynthia gently, like a little child, and began to kiss her tenderly, first on the neck, then on the lips, whispering, you're such a beautiful woman now, so dear to me, I'm going crazy for you, please, never leave this house, I don't want to lose you, don't cry, my dear, we'll definitely get Kelly from the shelter and live together as one big happy family. Cynthia didn't resist and responded with a kiss to Gregory's confession. Love had never been a part of her complicated life, except for one dishonest guy. And then everything changed in her life. Moving to the city, giving birth, her mother's illness and death. She savored the tender confessions and couldn't believe her happiness. The next day, Cynthia and Gregory went to the shelter to visit Kelly. At first, the deputy director of the shelter refused to let them see the girl, thinking they were strangers. But when she saw the results of the genetic test, she started talking to them in a completely different way and agreed to let them see the girl. Poor Kelly had lost even more weight, and when she saw Cynthia, she immediately ran to her, climbed into her arms, hugged her around the neck, and cried, Aunt Cynthia, did you come for me? Take me away from here. I feel bad here. The girls bully me. They fight and take away my toys. The child cried heavily, and Cynthia struggled to hold back her emotions. She kissed her cheeks, wiped her eyes, and peeled her a sweet tangerine. I'll take you, I promise. I won't leave you here. You're my little girl, my poor little girl. Aunt Cynthia, where are my mom and dad? Why aren't they taking me home? I want to go home. Don't they love me anymore? Cynthia wanted to scream. I'm your mom. I'm your real mom. But Gregory looked at the girl and quietly began to tell her, Come on, Kelly, your mom and dad love you very much. How can anyone not love such a wonderful girl? But it so happens that they are very far away right now and can't come back from there. And Cynthia and I love you very much. And Joe misses you. We'll take you back with us for now. You'll play with Joe again. Go for works with him. Like back on his birthday. Remember, will you come live with us? The girl nodded and once again trustingly hugged Cynthia, who led her to the other children to distract her from the conversation with the deputy director. Meanwhile, Gregory tried to persuade the woman. Well, you see for yourself how the girl interacts with us. How unhappy she is here. She's used to being at home. Let her stay with us, under my responsibility. I'm a businessman with a good reputation. I'm sure you've tasted our cakes. Tomorrow we'll arrange all the paperwork with the lawyer, and he'll help us prove that Cynthia is recognized as the mother, and Kelly is the heiress of the murdered businessman. She's his daughter. Why make Kelly suffer he and wait for the cot's decision? The deputy director of the shelter agreed with Gregory and allowed Kelly to stay with him at home. The joyful man entered the playroom, picked up Kelly in his arms, and smilingly said, Well, Kelly, I've arranged it. We're taking you from he now. Are you ready to come with us? The girl clapped her hands joyfully and shouted, Yes, 
I'm ready. I'm going to Aunt Cynthia's. Joe was thrilled that his friend now lived with them. Everything is more fun to do together. Play, eat, and run outside. And Cynthia quickly got used to taking care of both kids. After his mom's death, Joe had missed female warmth, attention, and affection. So he was happy to have Cynthia around. Gregory had already forgotten how wonderful it was to have a beloved woman waiting at home. Kids, a set table, and a hearty dinner. He couldn't be happier and tried his best to take care of his now large family. Within a month, Wayne managed to probe Kelly's relationship with Cynthia and help them process all the documents. Additionally, the girl was officially recognized as the heiress of the murdered businessman. And now all the assets and property of the deceased spouses belonged to her. But since Kelly was still young, Cynthia could manage everything as her biological mother. In one moment, the poor girl became a rich woman. Now Gregory's parents no longer treated her hypocritically. On the contrary, they were happy about their daughter-in-law, spent a lot of time with their granddaughter, and often visited their son. Cynthia was almost happy, but she didn't know how to tell the truth to the girl. How to explain that the woman she lived with wasn't her mom, that her dad had passed away, and her real mom was her aunt Cynthia. Could such complex news be explained to a three-year-old? Cynthia decided to consult with Gregory. They thought for a long time, and then he said, Darling, I understand how much you want Kelly to call you mom, how important it is for you, but she's still too young to understand and accept such complicated news about her parents. And what if she emotionally shuts down? Remember what happened to Joe from stress. Children are very vulnerable. Their psyche is not yet ready for such things. Let's not traumatize the child, I beg you. Just love her, and over time, you will naturally become her mom. Because with time, bad memories fade. When she grows up and goes to school, that's when we'll tell her, we need to be patient. I'm sure everything will be fine. Cynthia hugged her beloved man and agreed with him. You're so wise. I'm very lucky to have met you. You're right. It's better not to talk about it to our daughter yet. Let's just live and love our children. Time passed very quickly, and now Joe is in the third grade, leading his mischievous sister Kelly to school in the first grade, holding her hand. Cynthia waves to them, and Kelly shouts to her, Bye. Mom, will Dad bring us cake from work today? My favorite cake with strawberry cream. Okay. We're off to school. Cynthia looked at her beloved daughter and her now grown up son Joe, and she felt so calm, how she loved her children. Kelly had long been calling her mom on her own. She no longer asked about her parents, and everyone was happy. Now Cynthia wasn't a poor girl anymore. She was the wife of a well-known businessman, looked well-groomed, and she had found her calling helping her husband in his business. She adored Gregory, and was grateful to God that they met near the store that day because he completely changed her life.